So talk about individual psychology, how uh, it's all about self-control and keeping records and uh, having written trading plans, all of which we will discuss. We talked about mass psychology, how, how the crowd sucks us in or tries to suck us in and, and how we need to isolate ourselves from it. W making your decisions in solitude and uh, not checking on the website what other people are saying. We talked about uh, classical charting. The, the problem with which is that it's very subjective. And, uh, and I strip down classical charting to just very, log very few logical and clear elements. Support, resistance, breakouts. And breakouts can be regular breakouts or kangaroo tails. When I began, uh, I had uh, gra uh, graph paper. You bought graph paper from several companies that sold it and sharp pencils. Uh, and then I remember buying my first electronic calculator to calculate, indicate, to calculate moving averages. Then I got myself a programmable calculator which had a little magnetic strip that went through the calculator. Now I could calculate more complicated indicators. And then I got my first computer, which was Apple II Plus, uh, and a first program for computerized charting. Well, fast forward to the present day, and, uh, and what we have is uh, an embarrassment of uh, riches. We have just too many indicators available to us. A person can just go and you know, look at 50 indicators or try to see what their combined message is. Or if he doesn't like an indicator A, he can go and look at indicator B. Uh, I often say to, uh, uh, to students, uh, if you give me a stock and tell me whether you want to buy or sell and five minutes with my program, I will prove that you are right. Uh, there is a wonderful book, by the way, highly recommended, The Paradox of Choice. The guy who wrote is a professor uh, in Pennsylvania. And uh, basically he says, if people have no choices, they are unhappy. You give them a choice, they feel happier. You give them more choices, they become even more happy. You give them even more choices, they become less happy. Because uh, if you have to choose between too many choices, uh, you always feel like you're missing something. So the same thing with trading. Let's keep it simple. Less, less clutter, more clarity. My rule is uh, five bullets to a clip. A technical trader is allowed five indicators. And if you're really desperate, you can have six. But seven, you have a problem. Why five? Well, because open, high, low, close, and, and volume. I mean, it, th there is not a lot of data you're looking into. And massaging the data 10 different ways uh, doesn't really help. I will be showing you my indicators. And this is what I use. I use a, a pair of moving averages. I use envelopes, MACD, and force index. I use four, and that's enough for me. Now, you don't have to use the same indicators, and you can, you're very welcome to use different ones. But my point to you is, don't overdo it. Choose a few and stick to them. So uh, what we will do in the next few minutes, I will review my favorite indicators with you. Please keep in mind, these are building blocks from which we will build a trading system. None of these indicators is a trading system. You cannot win in the markets with one indicator, cannot. Right? I said to you earlier that every single dot, every single price dot on this chart is a snapshot, a photograph, consensus, consensus, consensus. And that consensus keeps changing. And of course, a price bar connects the high of the time period with the low of the time period opening price, closing price. If you like candlesticks, uh, candles are fatter than bar charts, and the area, the area between the open and the close is fat, and it's going to be white if it closed up and it black if it closed below where it opened. So in any case, here is the history of this wonderful Google stock. And uh, here is a moving average. What's a moving average? Well, a moving average is like a composite photograph. Um, we take a picture of Mr. Google uh, every day at the close. And uh, we take last 22 pictures to a photo lab, telescope them into one photo, 
and now we have a composite photo of Mr. Google. Now, every day we're going to be updating that photo. And as we update it, the, the moving average line emerges. So a moving average line is a composite photograph of the market. If it's a short moving average, it's a short term uh, composite. If it's a long term moving average, it's a longer term composite. This moving average gives us two key messages. Message one, what's the, what's the slope? You know, this, this uh, eternal dilemma, what do I do at the right edge of the screen? Is the trend still up or is the trend now down? And I'll say, well, uh, here Mr. Google was getting more depressed and here Mr. Google becomes happier. So the trend of the moving average is up. And that's, that's what I used to identify the trend of the market. And by the way, I use only exponential moving averages because simple moving average responds to each price twice. When price comes in and when it's dropped off at the tail end. And exponential moving average only reacts to incoming prices. Now, if you're using a 200-day moving average, it doesn't really matter one day. Uh, but, but if you're using a 10-period, 20-period moving average, exponential it has to be. So that's message one. Mr. Google is getting happy. So we're going to have to look at this market for buying opportunities. Message number two, the distance from price to the EMA. You can see how prices run away from the EMA and come back. Run away, come back, run away, come back, run away, come back, run away, and coming back here. So where do you think is it better to buy? When they are far away from, from the moving average or near the moving average or below the moving average? Now we have two moving averages here. And here comes the key on which my entire approach to trading is based, whether it's long-term uh, trading uh, or uh, short-term day trading. All my trading is based on this thing. We have two moving averages. One is fast, one is slow. I call the area between those two moving averages the value zone. There is a difference between price and value. You decide to buy a shirt. You wait until you get a circular from a department store which says uh, these shirts that look very nice to you are 40% off. And so you go and you buy them because you figure that the price of the shirt is below value. Option B, you're going, you're going to this workshop, to this conference, and uh, you stop by for a little breakfast uh, and you spill uh, a container of uh, cranberry juice on yourself and you really don't want to go to the workshop dressed like that and plus it's wet and it feels uncomfortable. You walk into the store to buy a shirt. Uh, uh, the only shirts they have are uh, $75 shirts. Well, you buy it, right? Because you have no flexibility. You're not, you, know, you, you need it now. So what is the value of that shirt? Is it $75? Is it $40? Is it $60? Right? So uh, a fundamental analyst will, uh, uh, will look at a company and analyze its balance sheet and earnings and inventory, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the technical analyst will look at the chart and say, well, this is what all the buying and selling is being done. This purple line is short-term consensus. This orange line is a long-term consensus of value, and so value lives somewhere in the zone between those two moving averages. And now you ask yourself this question, am I going to be uh, a value trader or a momentum trader? If you're a momentum trader, you're going to be buying these things when they explode in a rally. Uh, if you're a value trader, uh, you say, well, price, the trend is up, moving average is rising, let me buy it when it pulls back into the value zone. This is the key, this is the principle. I want to buy at or below value. So this is my first tool. A pair of moving averages define the value zone. It really creates a whole new sense of structure for the charts. You can look at any chart and ask yourself, is it trading above or below value? We were looking at, at the DAX. 
So wh where is the DAX trading now? Is it above or below value? It's clearly above value. It's way above value. And it, it's about as high above value as it ever gets. Tells you something, right? Not to get too happy and too excited. DAX is over 10,000. Uh, that, that's a psychologically important number. What about during this kangaroo tail? Was DAX above or below value? It was, it was way below value, right? We go to the chart of uh, S&P. Look at this wonderful bull market of the last couple of years. Now, this is a weekly chart, so everybody presents one week. And you can see how every few weeks there is a panic attack. And when people panic, they sell off S&P value, 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 kangaroo tail, by the way, value, another kangaroo tail, value, value, big panic, way below value. But you see this pattern, right? When I see something like this, for me, it provides a sense of certain peacefulness. I know that I don't have to be anxious about missing the train. This train makes stops every few months. So this is the concept of, of, of a pair of moving averages, identifying the value zone. Tool number two, envelopes. There was a mathematician, uh, Benoit Mandelbrot. He, he died a few years ago. He was one of the more prominent mathematicians of the century. He was hired at one point by the Egyptian government to model prices of cotton. So Professor Mandelbrot studied them for the longest time, wrote a paper which earned him all kinds of academic awards. And the conclusion was this, hold on to your chairs. Prices oscillate above and below value. Uh, there, there are very few facts in financial markets that I think so, maybe, makes sense to me. But this is a fact, prices oscillate above and below value. Well, if prices oscillate above and below value and we can define value, I think we did. Now we need to define the, the, uh, the swing of those oscillations. And if we can define, if we can figure out how far they swing from value, we can trade against deviations and for return to normalcy. I do it uh, with envelopes or channels. I draw my channels uh, parallel to the slow moving average. And I draw them in such a way that they contain approximately 95% of all prices. So basically two standard deviations. In trade station, I have a tool called auto envelope. Uh, in uh, stock charts, you can use Keltner channels. They work very well. And it doesn't really matter exactly what you're using as long as you're consistent with that. The difficult one is EMA envelopes because uh, they use certain percentage of price for the envelope and that percentage changes. For example, for weekly charts, you need double the percentage than for dailies. So you're constantly going to be typing numbers, but Keltner channels will do the job. So setting an envelope is like trying on a shirt. You want a shirt that goes from button to button without letter O and that and only your wrists and your neck stick out. And so a good envelope hugs prices. Warren Buffett is fond of saying that uh, when you buy a stock, you become a partner with a manic depressive fellow he calls Mr. Market. He says the only good thing about Mr. Market, he wants to buy you out every day and also he wants to sell you his shares. And he says most of the time you should ignore him because he is crazy by definition. But every once in a while, says Buffett, Mr. Market becomes so depressed that he offers you his share for a song and that's when you should buy. At other times, Mr. Market becomes so manic that he offers a crazy price for your shares and that's when you should sell. How do you identify depressed or manic? Well, I do, I do it with channels. Here, Mr. Market becomes manic and here, Mr. Market becomes depressed. You know, they say a neurotic builds castles in the clouds, a psychotic lives in those castles, and a psychiatrist is the fellow who collects the rent. Let's swing to our charts uh, for a minute. Here's the chart of the S&P. What's the state of Mr. Market according to this chart? So uh, right now, Mr. Market is way outside of the envelope. He is high as a kite, flying. Bulls are in charge, optimism is up. Um, prices above 
upper channel line. This is a dangerous state of mania. A question that often comes up, what about Bollinger Bands? Well, Bollinger Bands are good for only one type of trading, options. Because Bollinger Bands, as you can see on this chart, they're tremendously volatile. They go far away from, from the moving average and far below and far above. <clears throat> Volatility determines option pricing. And so that's where Bollinger Bands make sense with options. But not with stocks, not with futures, not with indices. Okay, tool number three. This gentleman, Gerald Appel, invented an indicator called MACD, Moving Average Conversions Diversions. Years ago, he invented this indicator, MACD lines. MACD is a combination of three moving averages. But you have two lines, a fast line and a slow line. And uh, Appel was looking for their crossovers, but that, that's ancient history. In the 1970s, when the first technical analysis software became available, they began calculating the difference between MACD lines and, um, and at that point, developed an indicator called MACD histogram. And uh, MACD histogram is the difference between the two MACD lines. So the fast line represents short-term market consensus. Long-term line, long-term market consensus. When the fast line rises above the slow line, it shows that the market is more bullish in the short term than it's been. And so MACD histogram rises. Because it constantly measures the spread between short-term and long-term consensus, I say it measures the power of bulls and bears. Here, bulls are coming in, bulls retreated, bears came back in, and here, bulls come back. And you can see how this uh, uh, Google is making higher and higher highs, and bulls are becoming weaker and weaker and weaker. To me, this is like taking an x-ray uh, of, uh, of the structure of the markets below the surface. So rising MACD histogram, bulls in charge, falling MACD histogram, bears in charge. The slope of MACD histogram is sort of a garden variety signal. You, you, uh, you can take, the, like for example, here at the end, Mr. Bear is getting stronger. This is a garden variety signal that occurs at every bar. But a really major signal occurs not, not often, quite infrequently. And that signal is this, a divergence. Here is a chart, a bullish trend and the power of bulls. Bears come in and break through the zero line. The stock rallies to a new record high. And this is the power of bulls. I mean, this is what I trade. This is what I look for in terms of trading. Just look at this, new high in price and the pattern of a MACD histogram. Here, this uh, Comcast drops to a MACD histogram establishes a new low, maximum power of bears. This is still part of the same low. It's not a divergence because there was never any crossover to the upside. Here's a crossover to the upside. I call it breaking the back of the bear. And now MACD histogram sinks again. B Mr. Bear here and Mr. Bear here. Lower prices, more shallow bottom. Bullish diversions. Buy, 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 buy. Zero line must be crossed between two tops over no diversions. This is not a diversions. A. But ABC is a diversions. And here's something that came from Kerry Lavorn, from my partner in Spike Trade. Uh, he calls, he, for years, he's been calling himself a data junkie, which he is. Uh, he did uh, extensive research, and he showed that the distance between the two tops or bottoms should be 20 to 50 bars. And the smaller just the better. In other words, here the bottom ends. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Very short distance, very powerful stuff. Uh, or the distance here. The, the, the shorter the distance between two tops and bottoms, the more powerful the diversions. If you have a, one top here, the other top in the middle of the chart, it's uh, forget about it. So 20 to 50 is the distance. And also the second top or bottom has to be less than half the height of the first one. 
the histogram has to be half the height at the second top or second bottom. Half the height or half the depth. Yes? Does a divergence on one time frame matter more to you than on another time frame? A uh, weekly divergence versus a daily divergence on the same yeah. security items? Absolutely. The bigger the time frame, the more meaningful it is. Um, a divergence on a weekly time frame is much more meaningful than on a daily time frame, is much more meaningful than on an hourly time frame, is hugely more meaningful than on a 10 minute time frame. The, the bigger the time frame, the more important. Tool number four is volume. Uh, Joe Granville famously said, uh, volume is the steam that makes the choo-choo go. When I look at volume here on this chart, it doesn't speak to me. Volume was high here, it declined going into the bottom, supposedly a good thing. But you know, I'm looking at these bars and, 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 and I start squinting. The, the, the volume bars alone don't speak to me. So uh, I invented an indicator for measuring volume and we'll deal with this in a few minutes. So these are the four tools I use. Moving averages, envelopes, MACD, and the fourth one, force index. We'll be with it in a second.